All right, let's get started. So we're very happy to have Ms. Nincina Euro Seljak from um, UC Berkeley. Uh, Yorosh uh, got his uh, PhD at MIT in 1995. He then went on to a postdoc uh, at the Smithsonian Fellow of Harvard. Uh, then he went to the faculty at Princeton, uh, and spent time also as faculty in Trieste, Missouri, and he joined uh, the faculty at Berkeley in 2008. He's now uh, director of the Berkeley Center, for, uh, one of the directors of the Berkeley Center for Cosmological Physics. Uh, he's been active in uh, many fields of large scale structure and cosmology that I won't list, and today he's going to tell us about the uh, approaches. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a challenge to come up with something sufficiently theoretical here at CETA because there's such a uh, audience that likes theory. And so I thought I will uh, give um, a discussion of perturbation theory approaches to large scale structure. But um, I won't actually give so much uh, details about um, the uh, perturbation theories themselves, but more in terms of um, you know where they work and where they don't. So um, we have two different types of perturbation theory that we like to do in large scale structure. One is Eulerian perturbation theory, and the other one is Lagrangian perturbation theory. In one case, what you do is you assume that density perturbation delta is small, and you also assume that divergence velocity is small, and then you expand into powers of that. That's a well-defined expansion that um, gives you then a nice series uh, that you can then uh, integrate. Uh, if you have loop integrals, for example, if you have uh, um, correlation functions, uh, you have to do loop integrals. If you have, uh, for example, three-point function like bias spectrum, you already have results at the tree level, uh, and you know that's what we call standard perturbation theory. There's a second uh, perturbation theory approach, which is called Lagrangian perturbation theory approach, which where you actually don't work with density, but you work with displacement. Uh, you still have to assume something about how you go from displacement to density, and that's where you actually also assume that density is small. Uh, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's, a, it's a different expansion. Although, order by order, they should agree. In fact, order by order, the fact that order by order they agree uh, one can show in 1D very nicely. There was this nice paper by McQueen and White here, where they've shown that basically Zeldovich, which is just first order uh, Lagrangian perturbation theory, is uh, a result of an infinite sum of uh, Eulerian perturbation theory. So in this case, and in this case it's also exact. In one dimension, uh, Zeldovich approximation, as we call it, is actually not an approximation, it's exact. And that's because the force is independent of, this, of the distance in 1D. So it's a very special case. But um, I just want to emphasize uh, uh, one point, which is the perturbation theory assumes that density perturbation is small, and it fails at a place where density becomes infinite. We, show, we call this place orbit crossing, shell crossings, uh, and that's where the halos form. So whatever we do in perturbation theory, we really should not expect it to be perfect. Uh, an example in 1D is shown here. Again, this is from this paper. Uh, you have uh, second order uh, linear, for example, is green. Second order SPT uh, is blue. You see second order SPT differs from the exact solution already quite early on, both linear and second order SPT. Zeldovich, which is red, is exact relative to the full nonlinear solution all, all the way up until shell crossing. Once you have shell crossing, it's no longer exact. Basically, what happens is you have these shells of um, Lagrangian shells, which then just cross each other and continue to stream, because in the logic approximation, basic particles just stream uh, along straight lines uh, without any change of velocity. And we know this has got to be wrong. OK, so the bottom line here is that perturbation theory uh, cannot possibly account for shell crossing. OK, so um, what does that mean? Uh, oh, here is uh, the same thing in 3D. Uh, for one specific perturbation theory, which we call Lagrangian perturbation theory, this actually is actually two, uh, two, uh, second order Lagrangian perturbation theory. But the same thing happens. Basically, you know, Lagrangian pertur perturbation theory gets the right, gets correctly the, the large scale structure, but it, uh, at the places where shell crossings occur, the particles keep diffusing, streaming through, and you don't get uh, highly uh, high density objects called halos. Instead, you get blobs. So. Um, so what can we do then? Uh, we can parameterize our ignorance. 
Uh, the simplest thing we can do is just take the ratio, take the ratio of the true answer to the, to the, to the perturbative answer. Like in 1D, for example, you can take this ratio. Uh, we, call sometimes, we sometimes call this ratio transfer function. And then we also know that, uh, at least in the low k limit, we know that this ratio has to go as even powers of k. And so, for example, we can just write it in this form. Or we can expand into even powers of k. All right, and that's essentially what the so-called effective field theory approach uh, does, at least in the simplest possible case, um, which I'm describing here. Then there are many other uh, reasons why perturbation theory um, breaks down. Um, but this one, if nothing else, shell crossing certainly causes perturbation theory to break down. And so you have to throw in, uh, basically, uh, arbitrary parameters, which we call these EFT parameters. At the lowest order, it would be just one parameter, this uh, alpha k square. And then you know you could put in k to the four and so on. For example, again in one D, you can do this uh, exercise. You can take the ratio of the true simulation to the perturbation theory. Uh, if you uh, take it against this um, Zeldovich, the L LPT, uh, this transfer function. If you do the first order expansion k squared, that you know extends you from where you were here. So that where Zeldovich uh, is where. It's, uh, Actually, I'm not showing here. Uh, Zeldovich is. And, well, yeah, I guess this one, yes. You see, basically, Zeldovich itself is failing uh, very rapidly. But you've, if you add one extra free coefficient, then you go from this, you go to this. You know, and you extend the range of k by you know, considerably. All right, so that's, uh, and with one, with the one for free parameter. Now, if you go, if you take three three parameters, you know A, B, and C, for example, then you can extend it in further in K. So uh, it's nothing, obviously, nothing, nothing. There's no physics in this, in, you know, except for except for the fact that we know uh, that it has to be even powers of K. Uh, but that's what it, you know, that's what it amounts to, right? Now, um, the, K, the K here is, is so this is standard perturbation theory of the relative. Well, um, so that's a good question. Um, this is, first of all, this is 1D case, right? And uh, as I said, the sum over standard perturbation theory gives you Lagrangian, first order Lagrangian perturbation theory. So here, for example, we have a one loop standard perturbation theory is, uh, you know, this one here. Two loop is, uh, I don't know, this one here. Three loop, five loop is this one here. And then all of them together is actually this one here, which is so just a logic. Is that K Euler differs from K Lagrangian in sort of a fundamental way? Right, but well, in one D, you don't have to worry about that because, as I said, in one D, uh, uh, Lagrangian perturbation theory is superior over standard perturbation theory in the sense that it's actually exact. Uh, yeah, right, for one D. Yeah. All right, so let's move on then to three D. To three D, there's uh, even more of a problem, uh, which comes from the fact that not only uh, we have shell crossings, but we also can't solve perturbation theory uh, properly. We do not have an exact pertur perturbative solution. Uh, and the problem is that, and this is a problem both in standard perturbation theory and in Lagrangian perturbation theory. And um, basically what happens is that in, uh, uh, in 3D, you have high order correlations between, you have high order displacement. So Lagrangian perturbation theory is no longer just uh, Zeldovich, you have one First order Lagrangian perturbation theory, second order Lagrangian perturbation theory, and so on. And uh, these, the higher order you go to, the higher contribution from high k modes. All right. This means you have to, and then if you want to do, let's say, two-point function, you have to integrate over high k modes. And these integrals uh, are in the regime where delta is already larger than one. You have so basically you have loop integrals. Uh, and in these loop integrals, you would only trust the low k part of the loop integral, and you would not trust the high k part of the loop integral. And so because of that, then uh, in 3D, even perturbation theory itself uh, is not reliable. I said it's true, this is true both for Lagrangian and, and uh, Eulerian perturbation theory. Here's one example. For example, if you ask what is the RMS displacement field doing, um, here's actually a function of redshift. Uh, and this is, uh, these are n-body simulations. Uh, and you compare, actually, uh, RMS displacement. Well, it's not RMS. Yeah, it's RMS square, I guess. Um, this is essentially what we call velocity dispersion uh, divided by linear. It's actually very close to 1 in simulations. But Lagrangian perturbation theory says it should be increasing um, 
uh, towards lower edge. And the reason it says that is because it has this uh, you know, second order two loop integrals uh, or even one loop integrals that are at high k and give spurious contributions. Uh, physically, actually, we think we know why this is happening. Uh, we essentially, in this displacement field, we have to cut it off. Displacement, displacement stop, particles stop displacing once they have trapped inside uh, uh, dark matter halos. All right? they, they stop uh, doing this streaming. Right? So this number sh is suppressed due to this nonlinear effect. So physically we know that, but basically, you know, perturbatively we cannot really look at that. Okay, so um, the situation uh, is that uh, we have many different uh, perturbative approaches uh, because of this. For example, we have standard perturbation theory at one loop, at two loop, even at three loop. People have done even three loop calculation. Then we have Lagrangian perturbation theory at one loop and two loop and so on. And it's not clear that the higher orders are obviously better. Uh, so what you can do, for example, you can throw in these uh, parameters, um, these EFT parameters, and ask the question, in which case do you need fewer parameters? All right. For example, you can add this 1 plus alpha k square. So this is what we have done here. And we have asked, is this alpha uh, a constant, independent of k, or is it running with k? If it's constant, then you could say that, um, well, maybe you can get away with a single parameter and you can extend range to much higher k. If it's not constant, then you need, it means you need to describe it with more than one parameter. And you know, here we actually looked at a whole bunch of these models. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, but the bottom line is you know, they all show quite a lot of running of this parameter. Uh, and perhaps the best one is this one here. Uh, this one here is actually uh, two loop SPT. And you, know, you can see that this one here gives you a roughly constant alpha. Forget about this low k here. I think we think here we have numerical issues. Um, but in this range, this is more or less constant. And it takes you up to k of maybe 0.3 or so. Uh, and so the bottom line is that with two loop SPT and with one free parameter, you know, you know this is taking us maybe to uh, 0.2 or 0.3 uh, h over mega parsecs. This is all at redshift zero. Okay. So, um, yes, they are in particular redshift dependent. Yes, uh, you can think of this as these parameters. Uh, this, yeah, this is all redshift zero. This parameter, for example, grows as um, growth factor squared. So if you go to redshift one, for example, this parameter will be, uh, you know, factor of two or three smaller. Uh, and all of uh, and this, all these things improve in the sense that you can go to higher k to get a, a given agreement. Okay, here's another way of saying this. This is from oops, you know, a recent paper by Vlach et al. And again, uh, I mean, just to give you an idea how bad or good are these things. Um, the points are the simulations. Uh, one loop SPT would be the green. You see it's above the simulations. Uh, one, loop LPT, uh, sorry, uh, one loop LPT, which is Ldovich, is uh, red. It's below the simulations. And then if you add three parameters, um, which, uh, for example, you, you have different EFT parameters, right? But basically, okay, it's easier to, to look at this, for example, at the error. Then you see that uh, Zaldovich by itself fails completely already at very low k. Uh, SPT fails quickly again at very low uh, k. But if you add one free parameter, then you can extend these things maybe to k of 0.2. Uh, again, at redshift zero. So um, if this is the whole story, then the story is, well, you cannot get perturbation theory to work without adding free parameters. You know, maybe it's not a big deal. That's, after all, that is what effective field theories are supposed to do. They, you know, you parameterize small scale, small scale physics into some parameters. You get their value from observations, or in this case, simulations, and then you can use this and apply it to other things. All right, but so that's the story. Now, it is slightly better than that uh, in the sense that uh, there are situations where perturbation theory actually does work. And I'll go through two examples. Um, the first one are uh, wiggles. Now, wiggles, there are lots of cases uh, where we have wiggles. Um, first of all, we have wiggles because of the baryonic acoustic oscillations. Uh, this is this normal model, as we call it. Um, and here, I'm, what I'm showing here is um, the, the black points are the simulations. And I'm showing, so what we've done, we have run uh, two different simulations, one with wiggles and one without wiggles, but using the same initial conditions. So when you take the ratio, the sampling variance cancels out, and you get then very nice um, 
uh, result of the, from these wiggles. Um, the blue line is the linear theory prediction. And you can see that these wiggles are damped to, to higher k. So these are just a standard BAO. We have known that there is this damping in the wiggles for a long time. But we can try some other wiggles. For example, here we try these um, monodromy models. Uh, and you, but we added them on top of the BAO wiggles because that's the most realistic case. So maybe it's not so easy to see them. You see there's a wiggle here. The monodromy models are basically you know, wiggles in log k. And so you can see some wiggles here. We add a fairly small amplitude. Um, but anyway, so there's something you know, wiggly on top of this. Uh, then we added some more extreme wiggles, which are like here. These are now wiggles uh, um, uniform in k, uh, but with large amplitude and going to higher k, and then another set of wiggles like that. In all cases, what you see is that so these wiggles are completely damped at high k. Now, uh, the third line here is the Zadovich approximation. And what you see is that the green line, you can see the Zadovich approximation goes through the simulation points remarkably well. Right? In all cases, it goes through the simulation points remarkably well. Um, and so we think that this part uh, we know how to handle. And there's a physical reason why the Zadovich approximation is doing this correctly, which is that uh, one way to think about this is um, in the following way. What are these wiggles? They are just, in, in Fourier space, they are wiggles. But in correlation function, they're just a bump at a given position. So the situation is actually very similar to the CMB lensing, um, where in the case of CMB lensing, we also have correlations uh, separated uh, by, let's say, you know, uh, 100 megaparsecs, so BAO oscillations, for example. And then on top of that, we have um, basically random smearing of the separation of the two points, which comes just from the displacements, just from the displacements of the particles. Now, as I've said before, displacements actually are determined, first of all, they're determined by, la by large scale modes, mostly. Um, the integral that is relevant for displacements is the integral of power spectrum divided by k square, so it's heavily dominated towards low k. So it's actually something that even linear theory can predict well. And so the basic idea is that you take a bump in the correlation function 100 megaparsecs and you smear it out by these displacements, which are of order 6 megaparsecs. And that smearing then, it smears out the correlation function a bit. When you Fourier transform that, you get damping uh, of the wiggles. Right? And so this is something we really we think we can handle with perturbation theory. And indeed, you know, as I said, even Zeldovich does well. Now you can, in principle, ask, well, can you do it even better? And for example, here we have asked the question, what happens if you then add this EFT parameter on top of, let's say, Zeldovich or some, some of these other perturbation schemes? Um, and here, in fact, we have looked at this, um, the difference with and without these EFT parameters. In other words, how much does the EFT parameter, this, this alpha k square term, help to improve this? And if this were flat, then the answer would have been an, uh, none. Uh, basically, simulations predict uh, the difference between this, um, between simulation and the prediction without EFT parameter would be uh, flat. Simulations, we see there are wiggles. Why there are wiggles? Because this, uh, the simplest way to think about it is this EFT parameter, alpha k squared, is multiplying p linear. p linear has wiggles in them, and therefore there will be some wiggles in this difference. And um, so see, in simulations, we see this, and these models with EFT parameters also predict this. All right, so some are, again, you know, this one, for example, is this two-loop model that I talked about before. It does a pretty good job, right? And some of them are even, you know, we have some hybrid models. Hybrid means some combination of LPT and SPT. In any case, in all, in all cases, this is pretty good. But I really want to emphasize these are extremely small effects that I'm showing here. These, are, these effects say that this EFT is doing something right, but these are extremely small effects. And, he, and in fact, even just Zeldovich does a very good job in uh, looking at these dampings. OK. Um, all right, so uh, I'll have another example. The, yeah. When you hybridize something, um, it's a continuous variation or is it sharp? And how did you hybridize. It no, the hi hybridize is basically, OK, so uh, right. Uh, what is 1LPT? 1LPT um, means you leave some things up in the exponent. Um, like in Zeldovich, you know, you have the two-point function up in the exponent. 
There's a low wedge power spectrum can actually be done analytically, but there are terms happening as well. You can expand the, those terms and bring them down, and then they become standard perturbation theory terms, but only some of them, right? So you can say, for example, all right, I'll add to the um, Zeldovich, I'll add just the standard perturbation theorems that, that are missing in Zeldovich, but I'm, I'll add them downstairs, right? Not up in the exponent, but down. And right? that would be an example of a hybrid model, right? So in other words, you have taken LPT to the infinite order, but only for the terms that are there in Zeldovich, you know? But you know who take that um, e to the minus k squared sigma s squared uh, to all orders? Yeah, yeah, right, that one is up in the exponent, right? Uh, but sigma squared is linear, right? That's what I'm saying. Sigma squared, you keep linear. Yeah. Right. That, that would be an example of a hybrid model. So in other words, the other high order terms for sigma square, would, you bring them down and you make them SPT terms. OK, so anyway, so uh, I think I mostly said all of these things already. You know, um, what are the challenges uh, of this EFT approach? Um, well, first of all, one parameter is only an approximation. Um, these are free parameters. We ha they have to fit from simulations. In fact, there's huge controversy about this EFT business, uh, also because recently people have, have been sort of overfitting uh, in the past, and they have uh, uh, claimed that EFT works to higher k than it actually does for the same um, uh, value of parameters. Uh, and the reason is that the, the simulations just weren't good enough. So I think the situation has, clar has been clarified a lot recently by Baldov et al. and Foreman et al. And uh, the, the bottom line of that, uh, those studies is uh, what I said before, that two loop SPT plus one, one EFT parameter does a good job up to K 0.25 or so. Anyway, but th there is a fundamental problem with EFT, I think, is in the sense that it really uh, has been designed best to work in the regime where the scale separation is clear. In other words, where you're working for at K much, much less than K nonlinear. But that's a regime where we have the largest sampling variance. So cosmology is kind of not the ideal place to do to play this game because the errors are largest uh, at very low k because of sampling variance, but that's where the, you know, adding one parameter works best. Um, and basically, the fundamental problem is that nonlinear scale is just very close to the scale we care about. You know? We think nonlinear scale is around, uh, you know, ratio zero, maybe 0.3 or 0.4 or something like that. So it's actually very close to the expansion. OK. Um, the second, uh, second approach that I'll just briefly mention, which is that, well, you can try a halo model approach instead. Um, and uh, what you can do in that case, you can use some perturbative approach on large scales, but then add a halo uh, description on small scales. Uh, halo model means you kind of parameterizing it with uh, something that um, a halos would, would give you. And we kind of know what halos would give you. They would give you a halo profile uh, that you have to integrate over all masses, of course. Uh, and so they kind of give you a blob that looks like this. And you can actually, you know, if you do, if you take this approach, it's much more phenomenological approach. Um, then it turns out actually with, with only a few free parameters, you get, uh, you know, very good agreement to much higher k. For example, in this case, I'm showing you here, here there, there were three free parameters. Um, and the difference between simulations and this halo plus Zeldovich model, uh, you know, was good to, to much less than 1% to, to, to k of 1 or so, all right? So uh, you can actually ask the question, how do these approaches compare? Because there is a regime of overlap where both EFT and the HALO model should work. And I'm showing this here. I'm actually subtracting out here the Zeldovich part. So this is the, the part that is perturbation theory uh, in the HALO model. Uh, and the difference is then this blue line, this, this one HALO term. Uh, and uh, orange would be the EFT. Um, and you can see basically orange and blue agree here, you also see that EFT has more wiggles because the halo model has kind of, the phonological description of halo model is usually, you know, with blobs. Uh, uh, and so it doesn't have these wiggles. So this is, uh, the halo model is doing incorrectly here uh, for these wiggles. I already mentioned before these wiggles are actually very small because the lovages are actually already doing quite well on the wiggles. So they are small effects, but nevertheless they are there. And then as we go to higher k, you know, halo model takes completely over, whereas the, this EFT uh, terms, uh, the, this EFT approaches uh, break down, and you would have to add more and more free parameters here. Anyway, so that's basically where we are uh, right now in terms of uh, perturbation theory versus the halo model for the dark matter. 
uh, here is another plot of this uh, the total power spectrum from this halo model, right? You take the Zadovich part and you add these even powers of k. Um, in, turn, in this case, they're even powers of k only, not multiplying the power spectrum. Okay, I want to talk about second uh, application of perturbation theory, um, where um, which where we think actually uh, should work really well, which is the covariance matrix. Uh, and um, first of all, this according to some people, this is a major problem. I, I mean, I don't think it is, but uh, you know, people working on Euclid or something like that, they claim you need tens of thousands of simulations to get the covariance matrix for the dark matter, uh, for lensing, for example. Um, and however, if you, are, if you look, and so for example, there was this paper by Blood et al. They ran 12,000 simulations, uh, and some of these predictions claimed you need even more simulations. So if you look at the structure of the covariance matrix, uh, there's always the, connect, the disconnected part. That's, we call this the Gaussian part, which is just proportional to the product of the two power spectra. Uh, and then there is a the connected part. The, so this is the part that is not Gaussian. Um, in fact, uh, you know, even if you just write for this co uh, connected part just a number, it turns out this is a pretty good model. Um, okay, but that's still phenomenological. Let's look at this, if we can do this with perturbation theory. Um, first, so there are two, two contributions to the covariance matrix. First one is from the modes which are, um, we, we say they are modes from the outside the survey. So these are the modes that do not average to zero on the scale of the survey. If they don't average to zero, then they, then they have some mean on the scale of the survey. And the way to think about this is that this is just a change of, uh, local change of curvature. It turns out that if you do, for example, um, just a full analysis in GR, that uh, local, if you erect local coordinate systems, you know, you can map everything into uh, local, um, local Minkowski or, or FRW coordinates plus curvature, all right? So everything is just a curvature. What does curvature do? Uh, think about it in terms of a closed universe. Uh, it, if you have a closed universe, first of all, perturbations grow faster, all right? And so they grow faster, for example, if you plug in a long wave mode, the per then the whole power spectrum on small scales, you know, all the perturbations on all scales will grow faster by uh, a number which is 6 to 8 over 21 times the long wave mode. And the second is, you know, uh, closed universe also shrinks more, right? Remember, you know, closed universe eventually, we, you know, collapses. So, um, or it's expanding less, whatever you want to call it, right? So that uh, leads to actually a scale, change of scale, which can be written in terms of the one-third uh, derivative of the power with respect to uh, the K mode. Okay, um, now this is true if you uh, keep the mean density uh, given by the global density. Very often, however, in surveys, we don't have a global density. For example, if you have galaxy survey, then you don't have a global density. You only have local density. And then this number, 6, 8, or 21, is changed into 26 over 21. So it's actually reduced a lot. All right, so, so this is a one contribution to the covariance matrix. It's actually quite, a, quite an important one. The second one comes from the modes inside the survey. All right? um, so for that, you can use perturbation theory. We call this uh, tri-spectrum uh, calculation, but of course it's a very specific one in the sense that we are just looking at this particular tri-spectrum configuration. Uh, so the, the three-level calculation has been done by uh, already back in 99 by Skojimar et al. And you know you get some nice expression. Um, it's a three-level, so there are no integrals except the integrals of the shells of k. Um, so that's nice about it. Um, the problem is actually this one doesn't. Uh, doesn't actually explain much. I'll show in the next slide how much it explains and how much it doesn't. OK, so we can go um, from three level, we can go to one loop calculation. Now, rather than do one loop calculation, what we have done, we have asked ourselves, let's imagine that most of this effect is coming from the long wavelength modes. The idea is that you have a long wavelength mode. This will change the power at high k, but it will change the power in a correlated way. Right? It will change the power of ki and kj. Now, let's then just ask how much are long wave modes fluctuating, and we integrate over those fluctuations. And this is this term here. This is just a sampling variance of the long wave modes. And a sampling variance, again, as I said before, it goes as p square. Right? So this is an integral of p square. The nice thing about this integral is actually this integral is convergent. It's, it's again another IR dominated integral because it's p square. And so this integral pretty much converges uh, 
by the time we reach the nonlinear scale. And then you we ask, well, what's the nonlinear response to this long wheel mode? Uh, power again? No, in this case, it's not in response to a mode uh, uh, up and down, but it's in response to a, to a mode that on average is zero, but in visualization not zero, so we have to look at the second moment. That's why we have this kind of one loop calculation here. And the response is sort of similar to the response I was telling you to response to the previous mode. So the previously, I, uh, sorry, this one was you know, 68 or 21 times p and so on. And here we have sort of, you know, we have different numbers here, but again, there's a, there's a first derivative, a second derivative, and, a, and there's a, you know, the, the amplitude change. So then the full covariance matrix, and for simplicity, I divide by the power, is just this. This is, a, okay, not the full covariance, this is the connected part of the covariance matrix. All right, so that's uh, at one loop. Um, but in fact, we can do even a two-loop calculation. Um, because, uh, let's see. Uh, because this calculation here came, this, what, what did I do here actually? I didn't explain this very well. Uh, here I'm asking what is the one loop contribution to the power at a given k from the long wave mode. It turns out that if you ask uh, it this way, the response is always the same. It doesn't depend on this delta L square in, this, in, the, in the limit of low, uh, low k of this guy. But you know you can do the full calculation. It's just slightly more complicated. I'll show it on the next slide. And then you can extend this calculation to the next uh, order as well. So this is what we are doing here. Uh, first of all, this is this formula that I've written down before, the blue line. Uh, green is the calculation, the corresponding uh, SPT calculation uh, at one loop. And then red is the SPT calculation at two loop. And, uh, and here are the simulations. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't put the two together yet, but you can see you know, uh, two loop calculation and then uh, simulations are in reasonably good agreement. So, um, but perhaps more importantly is the fact that if you ask what is EFT parameter doing, what's the point of EFT parameter? It's mostly trying to parameterize the wrong part of the, of those loop integrals. The wrong part of loop integrals comes from high k modes. Here, what we are doing, we are adding like a feature at low k. The response, the normal response of the low k feature uh, should actually be correct according to this EFT picture. So if you take the derivative now, respect to, to this long, long uh, wavelength feature, uh, there should be no, you know, in the, in the derivative, the EFT parameter cancels out because it should not change. And so there is no EFT effect to this thing. Uh, so that's, therefore, another situation where perturbation theory really should work. And who knows, maybe, maybe we, in this case we should even do a three-loop calculation. We haven't looked at it yet, but maybe we will. Um, maybe it's worth doing it for this specific situation. All right, so the bottom line is the final covariance that we're doing is basically adding one loop and two loop. Um, and it's actually a 12 order PT, if you want to think about it. So it, it goes actually, the answer goes as P to the 6. Um, of course, it's a very sp specific uh, form of 12 order. We didn't do delta to the 12 order and then uh, you know, compute all of the uh, possible uh, correlations. That would be impossible to do, I think. Uh, it's a very specific form, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a 12 order uh, perturbation theory calculation. All right, so how, do, how does it work compared to the simulations? Just take a step back. Yeah. Um, it's very curious because EFT is trying to stop the shell cross by some global um, effect, which is trying to suppress the k-squared. And here, you're saying that the long wavelengths are feeding back to the short, and that that's actually the more important effect, and so you're essentially challenging the underlying EFT? No, no, no. No, no, no. Actually, I think it's the opposite. First of all, I am making the assumption here that most of what the EFT is trying to do is actually correcting the incorrect part of the integrals in the perturbation theory that comes from high k. From high k. Yes. Here, what I'm doing, I'm just looking at the difference between uh, perturbation theory calculation with and without a low k bump. 
Okay, there's a, we put in a bump basically. Uh, here, here's the bump actually, sorry. We put in a bump at this low k and we ask what's the, what is the response. Yeah, since this is a low k bump, the EFT would say, well, the low k part of the perturbation theory is correct. We don't need to change anything. And therefore, the EFT will be correct from the perturbation theory without any EFT. That's what I'm saying. So you don't, for the derivative part, if you put a bump in a low k, there is no need to put in any EFT correction. Right, and that's consistent with EFT, but it also says that you don't, in, for this specific case, you don't need EFT. OK, so um, here we have some calculations. Um, uh, for example, here we take k prime of 0.1. This is the Gaussian part. This is the, the disconnected part that we have added. Uh, black is the covariance matrix from uh, simulations of Lee et al. Um, and then we have three level calculation contribution. This is this one here. Um, then we have this um, super sample variance part uh, that's. Uh, sorry, no, three level is actually this one here. Super sample uh, part is this one here, and then one loop part is here. If we add them all together, we get the blue line. And you can see that you know, it's not too bad compared to the um, simulations. Here I've chosen a different k. k prime is 0.3. Again, in this case, the disconnected part is very small because we have so many modes. Um, then let's see, three level is this one here. The super sample variance is one here, and then the one loop, one, one plus two loop actually here, is this one here. And again, you know, it's not too bad, right? Uh, in other words, uh, you know, you can actually use perturbation theory to derive the covariance matrix. Here is all of the case put together, you know, theory versus uh, the predictions. So we're still working on this. So this is not finished yet. But then, you know, basically, I'm just trying to emphasize that um, this situation where perturbation theory A uh, can actually work uh, without free parameters. And B, it does seem to work. Okay, there's one more thing I can uh, we can say about the covariance matrix, which is that uh, uh, the structure of this covariance matrix is, is, as I said, the response to the long random modes. That the first order is always the same. So you can think of this as integrating of the long random modes, um, and then, but the response since the response is always the same, uh, you can write the the connected part of the covariance matrix just as a, as a single eigenvalue. All right, you can write Cij as a single eigenvalue times the eigenvector. All right, and this is the um, eigen mode analysis of the covariance matrix, of the numerical covariance matrix. And you see basically there's one very large eigenvalue and everything else is around zero. And this is the eigenvector that we get from this. So if, if you do it this way, then actually you can think of covariance matrix uh, more as an external parameter. So in other words, you can add to the, to the data analysis, you can add an, another parameter uh, for which the eigenvector you know and you can just fit for this um, extra parameter. It's really a fi completely fictitious parameter. But the nice thing about this is then the, the, the rest uh, of the covariance matrix can be is completely Gaussian. All right? And so you can, in principle, even marginalize over this thing. Uh, if you have a theory prior for this, for the amplitude of this, even better. But you know, if you have enough data, maybe you don't even need to have a prior. Maybe just the data itself can allow you to determine this, this thing, as long as this eigenvector is not degenerate with, so, with the other parameters. Yes? So is it clear why there's single eigenvector dominance? Yes. Is that just because it's the diagonal term? And it, uh, surely ah, sorry. The Wrong direction. No, it's, it's, the, it's clear because of this thing. Basically, the response to the long random modes is 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 independent, independent of this guy? It's always the same uh, response. It's basically you know if, if you want this is this is basically the the eigen uh, this is basically the eigen eigen vector here right? more or less. Now of course in practice it's not true because we add two loop terms and so on and so forth. But yeah, if you do it numerically, you know it's not too bad to make this assumption. Right? All right, so uh, so we're starting to look at this thing also in the galaxies. All right, so uh, I've almost uh, spent all of my time working, uh, talking about dark matter, but I want to say at least some, some words about um, uh, galaxies until when I, I should go, till four or what? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, I'll go through now. Now, the harder, a lot harder part is, of course, doing perturbation theory for galaxies. Uh, the basic idea for the galaxies is the same. You start with perturbation theory. 
you see how far you can go with perturbation theory. Um, so some of the things can be modeled with perturbation theory. Uh, but then there's always more stuff on small scales that you don't know about, you cannot possibly know about, like shell crossings. Uh, and you basically want to have a uh, you know, nice transition to ignorance, uh, which obeys all the symmetries and all the physics, and you parameterize this ignorance, and you put it in, and you hope for the best. Right? And that's basically the idea. Um, in fact, the, this small scale physics uh, is so bad in the case of galaxies that we really, you know, work in, with a combination of, uh, you know, perturbative biasing and a halo model, uh, because just perturbative approaches we don't think can get us uh, high enough uh, in K to be useful. Okay, so um, I don't know. I, I have a lot of slides, but they're not very useful. So, you know, first of all, what is the complication number one uh, in the case of galaxies? You measure two different types of galaxies, like red galaxies, blue, uh, and normal galaxies. You see there's an offset in amplitude by a factor of four. Well, you already know you're not tracing dark matter directly, right? So you have to parameterize this with a bias. Um, there's a well-known description for the biasing. We understand why biasing happens. If you have rare objects, if you have long wavelength mode fluctuation, this leads rise to this bias. And the, you know, the rarer the objects, the higher the bias. In the previous slide, the red galaxies are rarer than the normal galaxies. That's why the bias is higher. OK, so if this was all there was to it to biasing, fine. We can marginalize over this. Uh, we even know how to, how to measure this bias from redshift phase distortions. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, you can um, go and look at the high order biases. For example, you can do the simplest possible expansion. Uh, like B1 delta plus B2 delta square. And it turns out that um, even if you start with this kind of approach, then gravity develops additional terms, develops something which we call the tidal tensor uh, bias. I won't go into details, but basically, you know, there's another bias that pops out just by gravity. Um, and it may also be there already in the beginning in so-called Lagrangian coordinates. We call this BS square. So at second order, we have two extra bias terms, B2 and BS square, that you know, one can go and look for in simulations. Uh, I'm just showing you, you know, uh, where we look for this in, uh, in the bias spectrum. If this bias spectrum was flat, it would have been just B2 bias. But since it's curved, we also have clear evidence for this BS square uh, bias. Um, all right, so we have two more parameters, uh, but this is for the bias spectrum. What happens if you want to go at one order in, uh, beyond linear in the power spectrum? Uh, at one order beyond linear in the power spectrum, let's just take this for simplicity cross correlation between uh, halos and dark matter. Okay, this is a linear term. But, um, and, but then we have this uh, second order cross correlation with second order. So this would be these uh, second order bias terms that I just talked about. But at the same order in terms of loop, loops is also third order density cross correlated with the first order density. Um, you know, you can do expansion to the third order. This was all done by McDonald and Roy. In fact, it was done here, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, you come up with another bias uh, parameter that we call third order non-local bias. All right. Again, you probably are familiar with this since uh, it was done here by Pat. And uh, you can go and fit for this parameter also. Now, this time we are fitting for this parameter in the, in the two-point function. We're looking, for example, halo density uh, uh, cross correlated with the matter density. And basically, if you just have those two par uh, bias parameters I mentioned before, you get this. Simulations are here. You clearly need something else. All right, so um, let me skip this. Um, so um, the BS2 term is very Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, suggests that uh, your choice of galaxies is going to make a big difference because it's an environmental effect. Sure. Uh, well, in this case, it's just about, it's just a, well, as I said, it's generated by gravity. Yeah. Oh, wait, uh, wait a minute. Are you saying the BS squared is only gravitational? Well, that's a good question. Um, so far, we have some evidence that it's not only gravitational, but not very convincing evidence. In fact, unfortunately, I don't have that slide uh, to answer that. Uh, um, 
but um, I'm just pointing to something you know very well. But the, the selection of the objects once you start to go for higher order terms is going to have an influence. But there's something that you told us, which is ellipticity matters a lot, right? Uh, exactly. For example, right. In ellipticity in Lagrangian coordinates, right? And how are you going to get away with that? I mean, it's not, you know, how are you going to get rid of it? No, you are. No, so I, therefore, that's my point. and that one will generate this term already in Lagrangian it, coordinates. Yeah, but then it makes one wonder about, which of course you've done a lot of, which is the selection of the objects based upon some kind of environmental thing in order to get more information from the surveys than just some global analysis of everything sort of. I mean, obviously that's being done, but here it's sort of a different issue because you would be trying to use some constraint about structure on longer scales, the non-local effect, I guess you're Yeah, but when you translate what, what you're stating into statistics, you know, then really, you know, this is the right approach, I think, in, the, in terms of classifying uh, the terms, right, uh, that come in. But this is non-locality, right? This guy is non-local, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're thinking about a different type of non-locality, which is the peak, peaks uh, non-locality? Uh, Uh, that would be exclusion. Well, okay. Well, let, let me get. Yeah. Let me get. Yeah. Anyway, let me. Let me. Let me say a few of these thi these terms. I, I think I should have it. Okay. Um, all right. Let me first uh, say this. Okay. So you can do the modeling for halos, and you know this is just to show you how well we do in Redshift space as a function of k and mu, mu being the angle between the uh, Fourier mode and line of sight, and you know we we do what we can, right? So uh, we have reasonably good agreements at. Uh, for low bias galaxies and then for higher bias galaxies, it gets harder and harder. Um, let, me, let me just mention, let me skip this. Uh, let me just mention beyond perturbation theory what we need to account for. Um, there are one halo terms uh, that we need to account for, but th those are, actually I'm showing here, one halo term is basically saying that you have a lot of galaxies close to each other. They just change the sharp noise. I mean, that's the point of this plot is just to say, yeah, let me not go into details, but it's just saying, you know, you, modeling this term as k to the zero is good enough. The part, the, the, model, the term that is not good enough is, is uh, retro space distortions uh, in, the, in the form of fingers of God. What's happening is that as you have satellites into the halo, they uh, have very large radial velocities because they are virialized. And these then transform into very large smearing along the line of sight. And if you look at the power spectrum, uh, it turns out this smearing uh, uh, for you know, large lines of sight, so for mu angle uh, close to one is very large. For example, if you go to K of 0.2, you already see a 50% suppression in power. Um, in uh, cases where you have cross correlation, for example, between centrals and, and satellites. So this thing you cannot model just as a K square, one minus K square term. It has to be modeled beyond that. Any such model has to be phenological. Of course, you can, you know, do a PDF of velocity and integrate and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, uh, you know, you have to go beyond uh, just uh, k-square EFT kind of approach. And so here we have tried, for example, exponentials and uh, Lorentzians and so on, you know, which, you know, give reasonably good uh, agreement. But the, the point I'm making is you have to go beyond uh, simple um, k-square terms. All right, so um, the stochasticity that we just talked about um, is a good way to define um, what is the difference between auto correlation and cross correlation? Uh, you can define stochasticity basically as delta halo minus bias times delta mass squared. You can express it in terms of uh, the two point functions. And the point is that um, this number is just shot noise, Poisson shot noise, one over m bar uh, in the simplest models. But because of effects like exclusion, the fact that halos um, don't overlap with each other, there are other effects for, uh, that you have to account for. Um, I don't know, let me just show you this example here. You plop down spheres. Uh, if they are non-overlapping, the accessible volume for these spheres is not uh, total volume, but volume minus n times the, the volume of the sphere. And because of that, then at high k, you may have 1 over n bar stochasticity, but at low k, it goes lower. That's just because of exclusion. Now, you have the counter 
uh, a term effect, which comes from this B2 delta square bias that I, I mentioned before, and that's shown here. So this term is negative, actually. This term is positive. And then when you put them all together, you have to <coughs> um, get uh, something that works. And um, this is still a uh, work in progress. There's, there have been few papers on this. Uh, this is from Baldov at all. But um, I think this stochasticity still needs to be understood better, basically. Especially its scale dependence. All right, so here I'm, I just want to, oh, sorry. Um, I have some plots mixed up. Um, so, um, and so here is what the same effect in simulations. Uh, you have this exclusion, and you have this non effect here. All right, and so this term is negative, this term is positive, and uh, you have to put them together. Uh, and when you look in the, in the power spectrum, for example, you get uh, something that for, high, uh, for low halo masses is positive relative to the shot noise, Poisson shot noise, but then it drops down to shot noise, Poisson shot noise. And for uh, large halos, because they have large ex exclusion, you, you get just the opposite. It's negative relative to 1 over m bar, and then it goes to 1 over m bar at high k. These effects are for, typically for a few percent. So if you want to do hypersynchronous cosmology, you need to understand them. These exclusion effects and, and nonlinear biasing effects and so on. Anyway, so that's that's where we are uh, on this. And then I just want to mention one more effect, uh, and then I'm done, which is that there's on top of that there are constraints that come just from peaks. If you have a peak, first of all, a peak um, well, you define the peak as the first derivative being zero, and second derivative being, being negative. Uh, what that leads leads to a k-square bias plus a smoothing effect. And so if you look at the bias cross correlation between halos and, and dark matter in initial conditions. You have a k-square effect, and you have a smoothing effect. Um, you have basically an enhancement of clustering. In fact, if you look at the BAO, uh, it's a, there's a huge BAO in initial conditions. So that's one effect that one is to worry about. And there's another effect that one is to worry about. So this is this effect. Um, and here I'm showing the evolution of this cross-correlation as a function of time. Initially, there's this bump, but then at, at late times, it completely goes away. And that's because other things uh, completely damp it. Uh, there's another effect that one needs to worry about, which is the so-called velocity bias. The particles, uh, the, the halos, the peaks, are really not moving with the same velocity as the dark matter in the sense that they are at rest respect to, to the surrounding matter. It's the surrounding matter that's falling onto them. And because of that, there is a suppression of velocity, or more precisely displacement, really, uh, for the peaks relative to the dark matter. And so this is actually shown here. Here is this effect. Um, at, so this one is actually at the initial conditions. And then it's suppressed as we go to redshift 0, but not completely gone, we think. So a lot of these things uh, need to be um, understood before we can claim that we understand biasing. Anyway, so let me just give you one more uh, slide, uh, which is this one here. Uh, and this is just saying how well we are doing right now when we put all of these uh, biasing effects together and all of this modeling together. This is a function, this is a modeling of CMAS sample in, in Sloan. As a function of k, we model it up to k of 0.4 uh, to about 1% or so uh, as a function of k and mu. And this, in, in this model, we have 15 parameters, not free parameters, because they are all connected to the halo mass. Uh, so the nice thing about biasing is we think we can connect these parameters all to the halo mass and maybe redshift in the sense that they are all uh, physically well motivated, these second order biases, stochasticity bias, all of that stuff, uh, even loss dispersions. Loss dispersion for a halo, we know it has something to do with, with the halo mass. Right? OK, so uh, we hope that with this kind of modeling, we can get uh, a lot uh, tighter constraints from cosmology, and we are planning to apply this to the data. But since this is not, this is a theoretical uh, colloquium, I will just stop. There. Let me skip this environmental bias since I don't have time to that, and I'll just go to the conclusions. Let me stop here. As I said, this this this, uh, this sound seed squared goes as uh, growth factor squared. Uh, if you think about, you know, grows as sigma eight squared. That seems to be a very good um, approximation. And also, uh, you think it was fine to compare different uh, EFT approach uh, on top of different uh, observation theory, right? Uh, and you are arguing that the uh, one less learning was 
Uh, well, yeah, I think so. To some extent, it, they have to get smaller as you go to higher redshift, and you know, so they have to get smaller as you go to lower sigma eight. Now, whether they are all exactly d square or sigma eight squared, I don't know. Yeah, that that has not been looked at very much. Yeah. Eventually, you have to apply to the Yeah, I, right, right. right. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I should really say when I say d square or sigma eight square, this is just this com this comes out of numerics. There's no derivation of this. You know, this is not something you can derive. Okay, so um, you know maybe you can hand wavelengthly derive it, but it's not. Uh, we don't think we have a clear understanding of that. Uh, and yes, you're right. For other EFT expansions, probably it would be different. Yes. Now, cider, I just say, I mean, what I think I'm hearing you saying is that EFT is just doesn't, is not useful. No, no, I didn't say that. Uh, first of all, first of all, there are situations where you don't need it, okay? But we understand why you don't need it, so that's useful. I think it's useful in the sense that it's consistent with EFT. Um, and And second, um, certainly has clarified the situation in the sense that, you know, for, for a long time people that were doing perturbation theory of dark matter didn't quite clearly say you cannot go beyond shell crossing, you need three parameters, right? I mean, that, I think that is kind of clear now. And, you know, and, you know EFT was one, uh, one small contribution to that maybe, but it was a contribution. Um, and uh, that's for the dark matter, right? Now, when it comes to the biasing, I think this EFT, what EFT people today call EFT terms, those are all in uh, McDonald and Roy's paper, right? I mean, the, the EFT was already in there. Okay, so, uh, so in that sense, it's nothing new. No? We've always used it, basically. You know, well, at least since that paper. Can you say a few much more general words about what this Body of work will let you do in terms of I don't know, extracting information about the order of Montgasianity or additional physical components in the universe? Or yes, yes. So here I focused on uh, the questions like covariance matrix, which, as I said, I mean, you know, if you can do it analytically, you should do it analytically and not uh, do it uh, numerically, right? Uh, but the hope is that um, if you only have a few three parameters at low k, uh, with which you can parameterize all the deviations, then you can actually extract primordial non-Gaussianity in a way that is much more reliable, if the information is coming from very low k. All right, so even if you're looking for deviations, let's say, of 10 to minus 4, and you're trying to pull it out from low k, and if somebody says, well, no, you cannot do this because you don't, you know, what if something, right? Then you can always say, no, there's no what if. The only possible terms are these terms. These are the terms that EFT tells you what they are. We have determined them. There's no, uh, no more if, right? So unfortunately, this is true for dark matter. Um, it's less obviously true for galaxies because of what I was calling stochasticity. Stochasticity has a contribution which goes as k to the zero even in low k limit, uh, and it's not necessarily given by the Poisson uh, 1 over n bar, 1 over the number of galaxies, number density of galaxies. Uh, and then the structure of that term is still, still needs to be understood better, the stochasticity term. There may be large scales in there that we don't understand, but you know, maybe not, right? Um, but assuming that we can parameterize all of these uncertainties with just a few free parameters, then I think we have a good chance of extracting even extremely small uh, signals from uh, uh, high order correlations, for example, at very low k, by basically just you know just by marginalizing over a few free parameters. Right? That's I think is the main uh, you know that's actually also an answer to your question. What, what has EFT uh, done? Uh, it has um, 
it tells you exactly what forms are allowed and what are not allowed, and if you pr parameterize them, and if you think you are in a regime where that parameterization works, then, then you're, you're safe. Right? Um, so let's uh, continue upstairs over cookies. We'll be taking your shot to dinner tonight. So, uh, more details on that later.